Okay. That's good. Yeah, so we we have a really tight schedule, so uh, we will try to be as, as punctual as possible. So uh, with your permission, then I would like to invite Professor Dr. Sato Oberman, the Director of the Environmental Humanities Center, for her opening remarks. I just going to just a welcome speech. Uh, it's going to be short. Don't worry. Uh, our distinguished director and the dean of the Faculty of Humanities, esteemed keynote speakers, and dear colleagues and students. This is a this is indeed a true pleasure for me to welcome you to the second international conference on um, critical and, and, and animal and plant studies. We are delighted to have you here join us, and uh, it's really a pleasure for me to welcome you to this uh, magical land of the fairy trees. Our conference is organized by the English Department, Faculty of Humanities, and the Environmental Humanities Center. Uh, and this is the first um, center in Turkey, which we launched in October uh, 2018. And I'm really happy to be its director. Here we have initiated a new curriculum that foregrounds new interdisciplinary approaches to environmental humanities. Our, our priority is to facilitate cooperation and dialogue and to establish global friendships because collaboration is the key to meet global environmental challenges. In keeping with this priority, we publish a peer-reviewed open access international journal called Ecocene, Cappadocia Journal of Environmental Humanities. Ecocene's inaugural issue uh, in June 2020 was devoted to the world scientists warning to humanity second uh, notice, which was uh, produced by the scientist Triple in uh, 2017. And the second one, 2020, called World Scientists Warning of a Climate Emergency. And um, I must here add that uh, we as editors, that is Sinan Akola, Stephen Hartman, and myself, are co-signatories of these warning letters. This is the first of its kind of a special peer-reviewed journal issue devoted entirely to the world scientists' warnings. Written by leading scholars in our field, the response essays in our issue attracted much attention among the scientists and was announced by William Ripple, the lead scientist of the warning letters on the website of the Alliance of World Scientists. Uh, and the, the caption read, which you can also visit, um, environmental humanists respond to the world scientists warning to humanity. Another initiative of our center is, to process, uh, is the process of establishing Anatolian observatory modeled on the regional observatories of the humanities for the environmental global observatory network to reflect interdisciplinarity and bridge building across knowledge um, communities. We also set in motion a series of symposiums to address relevant questions and theoretical constructs with real world implications of ecological and social changes and pressures from global climate crises to rethink and reimagine the human non human relationalities on our damaged planet and to contest the anthropocentric conceptions of planetary realities. The second international conference is thus entirely focused on non, non human quandaries, bringing together two interrelated research areas, namely animal and plant studies. This conference is the first of its kind. We believe that it will enable more cohesive modes of thinking to vegetal, animal, and human life. Since animal and plant life is fundamental to the geochemical cycles of the planet, we look forward to discussing with all of you here our intimate interconnections with non-human entities, which we hope will reveal how important it is for all of us to adapt multi-species justice frameworks and to promote 
a global biopolitics on the precariousness of life on earth. We really need the chain, the old familiar story of the human being as the sole master of nature, which is supposedly both a political agency and has legal rights. The story, this story of uh, the superior human being uh, above everything else here has caused massive exploitation of animal and plant life in global markets for disastrous growth. It is time to introduce new multi-species stories into global imaginaries, a task the interrelated fields of critical animal and plant studies have already undertaken. Blurring distinctions between natural and social sciences and the humanities, the critical animal and plant studies inspire new hopes for sustaining multi-species interconnections, and both fields communicate a message of revaluing all earthly agencies facing threats of extinctions. We hope that this conference will be helpful in imagining better ethical responses that take into account the voices of everything that is more than human, the diverse communities of flora and fauna that make our planet livable. We know that taking into account the unheard voices of disrupted non-human communities is of utmost importance in these precarious times. And finally, I want to express my understanding that for as long as we continue to give voice to all that is agentic and that suffers the consequences of environmental transformations, there will be hope. Well, I may sound like Beckett's, Samuel Beckett's unnameable character, but I will say it, we must go on. Thank you, a very warm welcome to all of you. Thank you very much, Professor Alpermar. Uh, now uh, I'd like to invite uh, the Dean of the Faculty of Humanities, Professor Dalton Barakata, for her opening remarks. She'll be joining us through uh, Zoom. Değerli bilim insanları, değerli katılımcılar, bilimle tekniğin özdeşleştiği günümüzde insanın doğadan koptuğu, doğanın tehdit altında olduğu bir çağı yaşıyoruz. Bu tehdit karşısında bilinçlenmek kaçınılmaz. Bu da bilime, bilim insanlarına yeni bir görev yüklüyor. Bu bağlamda bir doğa harikası olan Kapadokya'da bulunan Kapadokya Üniversitesi 2019 yılından beri çevreci beşeri bilimler alanında düzenlemekte olduğu sempozyumlarla öncü etkinliklerini sürdürmektedir. Bu yılda eleştirel hayvan ve bitki çalışmaları ile uluslararası bir sempozyum düzenlemiştir. Bu sempozyumda doğa karşısında yeniden bilinçlenmeye önemli katkılar sunacağına inandığım siz değerli bilim insanlarına hoş geldiniz diyorum ve başarılar diliyorum. Bu sempozyumu düzenleyen, bu alanda siz seçkin bilim insanlarını bir araya getiren Sayın Profesör Doktor Serpil Operman'ı ve Sayın Doçent Doktor Sinan Akıllı'yı kutluyorum. Ve bu seçkinliğe olanak veren Kapadokya Üniversitesi'ne rektörümüz Sayın Profesör Doktor Hasan Ali Karasar'ın şahsında teşekkür ediyorum. Tekrar hoş geldiniz. Hepinize başarı dileklerimle saygılar sunuyorum. Today, we live in an age when scholarship is perceived as synonymous with technology. In this age, the human has been ruptured from nature, and nature is under threat. It is inevitable that we must gain an awareness in the face of this threat. This threat assigns a new task to scholars. 
in its efforts to fulfill its own share of this task. Since 2019, Cappadocia University has been organizing pivotal conferences in the field of environmental humanities in Cappadocia, itself a miracle of nature. The subject of this year's international conference is critical animal and plant studies. I welcome you all to this event, which I believe will contribute significantly to the creation of a renewed awareness about nature and wish you all great success. I'd like to congratulate Professor Sartre Opperman and Associate Professor Sinella Kalu who have organized this conference and brought distinguished scholars together for this event. I would also like to extend my thanks to our rector, Professor Hassan Ali Karasak, and in his person to Cappadocia University for supporting and making possible the conference. Welcome again. I wish you a successful conference with my best regards. And now I'd like to invite our rector, Professor Karasak, for her opening remarks. Great. Çok kıymetli hocalarım, katılımcılar, sizlerin bir kez alayız. Welcome to Kapadocia, welcome to Mustafa Paşa, Kapadocia University. Kapadocia, Kapadocia Üniversitesi'ne öncelikle hoş geldiniz benim istiyorum. Bizim için e, pek çok konferans bugün üst üste geldi. E, O yüzden bir eksiğiniz olursa da aklınızı biliyorum. We have many events going on today uh, in Mustafa Paşa. There is a gastronomy event, there is a tourism event, there is uh, a, a, a health congress going on. And, and But th this is one of the most important uh, uh, events for us simply because uh, Environmental Humanities Center is our product. And in the name of Kapodoche University, I would like to welcome all the participants and express my heartfelt thanks to you all. We are proud to have the only environmental humanities center in Turkey and it's special in many ways. It's special in publishing one of the leading uh, academic journals, ECOSIM, not only in Turkey but in international recognized under the leadership of Professor Sarkin Oparman and Professor Akıllı, Sinan Akıllı. Uh, uh, I do receive a lot of feedback from uh, our international partners about our publications and Ecosim is a really a problem for us in that state. And Professor Oparman's and Professor Akıllı's efforts on Anthropocene and Environmental Humanities uh, changed many things in Cappadocia University and in our minds. One important change I should point out has happened in our university's priorities and policies and political standing. Our university, you probably know that, is now is the leading Turkish institution not only for uh, promoting sustainability in our own activities, but also at the national level, working with international partners like GSTC, Global Sustainable Tourism Council, setting the standards for sustainability and policy in Turkey at the level of the Minister of Culture and Tourism. In the second International Environmental Humanities Conference, Critical Animal and Plant Studies, definitely your contributions are very important for us and for the coming generations. While listening and reading your research, we sincerely feel that why do we really need interdisciplinary research? And I think uh, your field, environmental humanities, is the real interdisciplinary uh, example to be shown to many other fields as well. As a Turk, I can only say our culture attributes sacredness to some mountains, lakes, trees, flowers, fruits, and we, and we grow up with stories about them. And also, as former semi nomads, animals occupy an important place in our lives. We have volumes of written and oral literature about them, stories, poems, songs, etc. It's amazing for me to see the similarities in the English speaking world and in its literature and history. 
I, I was always thinking that these are special Turkish, you know, cultural uh, aspects, but in English literature, and also uh, one of the, uh, the speeches are going to be the, the, about the period of Italian Renaissance. It's also interesting in contrast to similar things that can take as well. This as well. Anyway, I should not extend this welcome speech uh, with my and to my childhood memories as well. I once again welcome you all and thank each one of you for your contributions. I hope this meeting will be very fruitful and those of you here as our guests have a good time in Cappadocia. And I again would like to thank Professor Oferman, Professor Akhtalde, Professor Tezian and all of you uh, for making this event real. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Kaysan. Now, uh, I would now like to invite um, Professor Sibel Dinchai of our English Language and Literature Department, who will be chairing the first uh, plenary session, uh, the keynote speech by Good morning, everyone. I'm really pleased to be here, having the honor of being able to introduce Simon Estock, uh, Professor Dr. Simon Estock, to you, who needs actually no introduction uh, for us, for any of us, I'm sure. But still, uh, let us remind ourselves what he's been doing so far and what he's going to present for us. Now, Dr. Simon C. Estop is a full professor and senior research fellow at Song Jung Kwan University, South Korea's first and oldest university. He's the editor of the HNHCR journal, Neo Helicon, and is an elected member of the European Academy of Sciences and Arts. Uh, Estop teaches literary theory, echo criticism, and Shakespearean literature. His award winning book, Echo Criticism and Shakespeare Reading Echophobia, appeared in 2011, reprinted in 2014, uh, and he is the co editor of five books Anthropocene, Ecologies, and Food coming out from, well, he already did, from Love Rutledge, uh, April 2022. Mushroom Crowds, Ecological Approaches to Militarization, 
and the environment in East Asia. Rutledge, again, March, it came out in March 2021. Landscape, seascape, and the equal statue imagination. Rutledge, 2016. International perspectives in feminist ecocriticism. Rutledge, 2013. And East Asian ecocriticisms. Macmillan, 2013. Oh my God, it's endless. His latest book is the much anticipated Ecophobia Hypothesis, came out in uh, 2018 from Rutledge, uh, reprinted with Arata as paperback in 2020. It has been translated into Turkish by myself. I have the honor, privilege, uh, because of my dearest friend, Sad the Opama, who just was the very means of me having this opportunity and meeting Simon. Uh, and it's currently actually is being translated into Chinese and Korean. Uh, Estop has published extensively on ecocriticism and Shakespeare in such journals as PMLA, Mosaic, Configurations, English Studies in Canada, and others. He is currently working on a book about slime in the Western cultural and literary imagination. Now today his speech is going to be on vegetable, vegetal narratives and the ethical treatment of plants. Welcome, please, the board is yours. Thank you uh, very much for that uh, very kind introduction. Can, can everybody hear me? All right, thank you. Thank you very much. It's, a, it's really a great pleasure to uh, to be here, to be back in Turkey, uh, and to be here face to face and not virtually. Um, before I start, I'd like to uh, mention that I have a, a subtitle to this and that I will be doing a, a fairly close reading uh, of this story and giving a summary of it uh, as it becomes appropriate. But before I begin, I, I would like to thank uh, some people. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Serpil Operman the director of the Humanities Center here at Cappadocia University for making this possible. Uh, Dr. Sinan Akali, the uh, director of the School of Graduate Studies and Research. Uh, uh, Dr. Sibel uh, Dintel for translating my book and for being just who you are and for doing the amazing work that you do. Uh, I'd like to thank also the, uh, the rector, uh, Hassan Ali Karasar, uh, the environmental uh, research, uh, Environmental Humanities Center here, and all of you for coming. All right, I'm going to start. Sorry for the long introduction, but I am very grateful and I need to uh, say it publicly. I'd like to begin my talk with the Venus flytrap, a plant that fascinates young and old alike in a manner that, at least from my experience, seems universal. I've seen the plants for sale in Korea and Australia, in the Americas and Europe, in China and in South Africa. It's a plant that upends our sense of agency and order, a plant that moves, moves quickly enough to catch a fly or a frog. And if you've ever tried to catch a fly, you know. It is a plant that eats bugs. And this is a reversal of the bugs eats plants just uh, order uh, with which we're all more, fa more familiar. Uh, it's a dynamic for which we use 3.5 million tons of pesticides globally per year to protect our plants. And I'd like also to say that almost everything I'm saying is somewhere in these slides. So if you miss what I'm saying, it's up there. Um, it's also the slides will distract you from me. The Venus flytrap is a plant that presents an upending of nothing short of the entirety of the enduring Judeo-Christian mythology about order and power, a tradition in which the imagined God proclaimed man that the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every bird of the heavens, upon everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea, just as I gave you the green plants, I now give you everything. At least animals and fish and all the creeping and flying organisms at one point had ethical consideration uh, in this narrative, but plants, no. Anyway, the fear that the world was, to, was commanded to have of us is part of this enduring global origin story that provides an ethical foundation 
for our existence and our philosophy. Carnivorous plants turn that fear around. They don't fear us, in fact, we fear them. They fill our ecophobic horror stories. The most memorable literary and filmic examples of vegetal agency are stories filled with terror and horror and both epistemological and ontological risks. Movement in plants, whether it is in the real plant, such as the Venus flytrap, or in fictional ones, such as John Wyndham's triffids, is, as Joni Adamson and Kate Sandlins have recently observed, a source of terror, a monstrous perversion of a supposed natural order in which purposeful movement is the capacity of animals and not plants. I'd like to stay with the Venus flytrap for a few moments. The origin of the name is very revealing. It's not that the plant is a thing so abhorrent and deviant that it must be otherworldly, that is from the planet Venus. Rather, the name derives from the goddess of love and sex, Venus. When North Carolina, North Carolina colonial governor Arthur Dobbs discovered the plant, it was perhaps hard for him not to notice that the two moist and red glistening lobes surrounded by hairs and sensitive to stimulation and touch resembled the human vagina. Hence the name, the goddess of love and sex. And I might add that the plant was also known by the slang term Tippity Twitchit, a more lewd reference to women's genitalia at the time. But this was not any kind of vagina that Dobbs and his pals were seeing, not the stuff of male fantasies and longing. Rather, it was the vagina dentata, the one with teeth. As one website explained, let me tell you, it's difficult researching this stuff because you get to all sorts of websites that you're not intending to go to. <laughs> as one website explains, the notion of a vagina with teeth dates back as far as Greek mythology and is rooted in the idea that the female body has hidden dangerous secrets and that a man who has sex with a woman may risk castration. It is a misogynistic paranoid fantasy about the sexual agency of women. Uh, hmm. You can't see the top of my, is there any way I can get rid of that ribbon at the top? Because Oops. Oops. Yes. I don't want you to miss out on anything. It gets exciting. Great, excellent. I don't know what that is, but okay. It was, uh, let's go back here. There we go. Okay. For millennia untold, it was precisely this agency and still is in many parts of the world that prompt men to exclude women from the full rights and privileges that men enjoy. The women's rights movement has not been easy, nor have its victories been uh, nor are its victories secure. Sorry, it's not coming in here. I'm pressing in, it's not coming in. Sorry, technical difficulties. <laughs> Either or. Okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> All right. Okay. It's like, yeah. Yeah. Okay. This, this is gonna work. Yeah. I mean, we need the slight shift yeah. more than. <laughs> but uh, but nothing's coming when I. Oh. Thank you. 
Um, so the women's rights movement has, has been grounded in various ideas about women as persons, as moral agents, and as sentient beings, and so on. Uh, and these are the bases on which uh, women are therefore uh, entitled to rights. The civil rights movement uh, combats racism uh, in a similar way, uh, that in similar ways that the women's rights movement has. Um, animal rights movements have also more recently tended to be grounded in similar ideas, but uh, animals have presented a more uh, have presented more problematical issues, such that Jeremy Bentham's 1789 uh, ideas uh, have gained uh, more traction. The question is not can they reason nor can they think, but can they suffer? Here, clearly, the basis for rights is the capacity to suffer. Now. I'm not entirely convinced that the capacity to suffer is the right way uh, to go here, nor am I entirely convinced that language, morality, or sentience are the right way. Suffering is an ancillary matter with the question of rights, and no less are language, morality, and sentience. If you come up here and kill me, you're not killing me. I mean, I'm already dead, right? I mean, my destiny is written. If not by you here today, then perhaps by a plane crash or a terrorist attack, or, and I keep my hopes up for this one, uh, for uh, by old age a long time from now. But whatever the case, my fate is sealed, my destiny is written, I am a dead man walking. Not so for my genes, nor for yours. Our genes, the genes in every one of us here today, have been alive for some 3.5 billion years. An unbroken chain from each one of the from, from from the past to each one of us, and I'm going to have to spend a little bit of time here uh, uh, talking about this about genes to set up the next part of my argument. Ruki Murakami explains in his epic novel One Q84, and this is all a quotation: "Human beings are ultimately nothing but carriers, passageways for genes. They ride us into the ground like racehorses from generation to generation." Genes don't think about what constitutes good or evil. They don't care whether we're happy or unhappy. We're just the means to an end for them. The only thing they think about is what is most efficient for them. And this is disturbing because it casts a long shadow over our own sense of agency. Famed entomologist, uh, the late E.O. Wilson, speaks directly to the question about relationships between genes and agency. He says, and I quote, genes hold nature on a leash. The leash is very long, but inevitably values will be constrained in accordance with their effects on the human gene pool. The brain is a product of evolution. Human behavior, like the de deepest capacities for emotional response which drive and guide it, is the circuitous technique by which human genetic material has been and will be kept intact. Morality has no other demonstrable ultimate function. This is from uh, Harvard entomologist E.O. Wilson. Richard Dawkins, uh, in his famed Selfish Gene, rhymes in yet more succinctly, they go by the name of genes, they are, and we are their survival machines. However we word it, the thought is terrifying. Our sense of agency is overblown. And more to the point of this talk, our sense of monopoly on ethical consideration is untenable. I mean, the pine tree forms the same function for its genome uh, as we do for ours. And if we're going to be hierarchical about it, um, the, the loblolly pine, Pinus teda, as Morgan Gannon explains in a CBC news piece, has a rather long genome with 23 billion base pairs. 23 billion base pairs. That's more than seven times the size of the human genome, which has 3 billion base pairs. A life well lived is a life lived in the service of genome, biologically speaking. But there is no hierarchy. In reality, all life literally does the same thing. It all provides a passageway for genes. Surely this is something to think about when we are talking about rights. Plants have as much right to do this as monkeys and as swordfish. Is it too close? Oh, sorry. 
the sound is only Oh, I can't. I can only hear myself. So. <laughs> I was wondering why I was getting looks from people. It's like, shut up. Okay. Is that better? I think so. We will see in a minute. Better than that? Okay, good. Okay. So there's no hierarchy. All life literally does the same thing. It provides a passageway for the genes. Surely this is something to think about when we're talking about rights. Plants have as much right to do this as monkeys and as swordfish, as people and as viruses. Recognizing this as fundamental helps us to avoid zoologizing uh, plants. And the term comes from uh, Monica Gagliano, John Ryan, and uh, Patricia Vieira, and I'll be referencing them again uh, a little bit later uh, in this in this talk. They use the term in their introduction to the language of plants, and it is analogous to the term anthropomorphism, as the latter is a projection of human characteristics onto non-human things. Zoologizing is the projection of animal characteristics onto non-animal things, and this is something surely to be avoided. Is the sound better now? Perfect. Okay, good. Okay. There's undoubtedly an element of zoologizing anytime we talk about the language of plants. It is inevitable. This doesn't diminish the reality that plants communicate with each other, with animals, with their ecosystems, and with us. And that this communication, whether we want to call it language or not, is sophisticated and nuanced, involving, as Galliano and et al. Uh, observe, hormones, electrical signals, pressure cues, visual articulations, olfactory bouquets, oral enunciations, um, micro mic microbial soil exchanges, and so on. But again, to be clear, there's no rational or logical reason why the ability to communicate should be uh, the basis for ethical consideration. It is as arbitrary a standard as intelligence, sentience, the capacity to suffer, gender, or hair color. And I've already explained that as genomic carrying cases, we're no different from earthworms or elephants, butterflies or buffalo, beavers or basil. Having said this, however, I do think that what plants communicate to us is essential in helping us to change our behaviors. Uh, and the, the stereogram is going to become clear in a minute why it's up there. I'd like to pull back a little bit at this point from the mic, which I should have done before. I'd like to pull back at this point and self-position. Uh, I philosophize, but I am by training not a philosopher. I uh, talk genomes at times, but I am by training not a geneticist. I may even talk about dark matter and agential realism at times, but I am by training not a quantum physicist. I'm a literature scholar, and one of the things that I'm deeply interested in is how literature can prompt us to expand our circle of ethical consideration. And one of the ways that it does this, as in the hard sciences, is by showing us things that we can't see without assistance. Often to prove to my students that we can look at things directly and not see them, I show them stereograms like this one. It drives them crazy. One of my favorite pieces of literature that really foregrounds vegetality in ways that really force us to see the horrors of the crimes we have done to plants and by implication the necessity for extending ethical consideration to them is Charlotte Perkins Gilman's The Yellow Wallpaper. And since Many of you here uh, may not be familiar with the story. Um, please pardon me for two and a half minutes while I give a brief summary of it because it's kind of essential uh, for what comes next. I know giving a summary of a story is kind of boring, but it's, uh, it'll be worth it. Uh, this American uh, uh, short story published in 1892 is a first person narrative of a young woman who is or seems to be suffering some kind of postnatal depression. Her husband, John, has taken her to a colonial mansion, like the one we see in the background there, uh, a colonial estate in the countryside for the summer rest 
uh, cure that he's hoping will um, take care of her nervous condition. She remains most of the time um, upstairs in the nursery uh, and she describes the torn wallpaper and the barred windows and um, the metal rings in the walls, the scratched and gouged and splintered floor, the fact that the bed is bolted to the floor. And we learn quickly that she's clearly or seems to be in a kind of patriarchal prison and that she is an unreliable narrator. She is neurotic. I mean, in the clinical sense, uh, that is, she's obsessive, and she's perhaps even psychotic, that is, experiencing breaks from reality. Despite her troubles, she uh, describes John as a good man who means well, and just, she describes herself as unreasonable. She begins obsessing on the details of the room and is troubled by the wallpaper itself. She sees things in it that others don't see. She notes it's sickly color and it's yellow smell, yellow smell, okay. It's a bizarre image, but not as nearly as bizarre as the moving, yes, moving images, moving patterns in the wallpaper. The narrator uses a second person and asks us to imagine, asks us directly to imagine a toadstool in joints, an interminable string of toadstools budding and sprouting in endless convolutions. And moments later, she tells us after pulling off some wallpaper, that the waddling fungus growths just shriek with emotion. It's a, another one of those strange images. There are patches missing. The wallpaper appears to be tearing off in places and she describes how uh, the paper stains anyone who touches it. She describes how the wallpaper appears to mutate more the longer a person stays in the room. She becomes more and more obsessed with this, with the designs of the wallpaper and comes to see a figure in the pattern. She begins to think there's a woman crawling on all fours behind the pattern. She feels that she needs to free the woman in the wallpaper and starts tearing shred after shred, strip after strip from the wall. John returns home, finds the door locked. She refuses to unlock it. He gets the keys, enters, finds her creeping around in the room, rubbing against the wallpaper and shrieking, I've got out at last, in spite of you. He faints. She continues creeping around the room, creeping over his body each time she passes it, the narrative reveals, I'm sorry, the narrative ends with her believing that she has become the woman who has been uh, trapped behind the yellow wallpaper. The end. Most readings or diagnoses uh, of this story um, have her as a kind of a, a nutcase, a woman driven crazy within an oppressive patriarchy uh, and the story as a searing condemnation of patriarchal medicine with a woman's deeply ambivalent story at the end as she symbolically crawls over the man now prone on the floor. It's a feminist story that ultimately empowers the woman, uh, damaged though she is. But there's far, far more going on here, far more that Gilman is showing us. The yellow wallpaper pushes its reader to see beyond the visible, both metaphorically and literally at one and the same time calling into question what it means to see the unseen and what it means not to see it. Haunted by pasts that refuse to remain in the past, the eco-gothic dimensions of this story become more pronounced the deeper the reader peers in. At the center of the story is paper. And obviously it is the visions of the narrator, the visions that the narrator has from the paper that generates the plot. These visions and the plot they generate in turn reveal for the reader things that might otherwise be unseen, including most obviously the, sub the subjugation of the narrator under uh, patriarchal authority. They reveal far more than this, however. Like the images in a 3D movie or a stereogram, there are things in this story that are not immediately present before, but uh, that are immediately present before, but not easily visible to the reader, at least not in the way that the narrator's suffering is. Indeed, the story exposes more than simply human relationships and histories, relationships and histories that reside in the paper itself. While exploring the explicitly entangled complexities of the truncated agencies of nature and women in the yellow wallpaper, it becomes evident that this story pushes the reader to think beyond the convenient 
anthropocentric and ecophobic notions of a vengeful nature toward a more balanced understanding of digital agency, an understanding of plants on their own terms. And it is in our continuing failure to do so, and in our continuing thwarting of the agency of the vegetal world, that the magnitude of eco-Gothic horror takes form in this story. There is definitely something going on with the past of the paper. The question about what it is that is in the wallpaper, what it is precisely that haunts, has been the topic of some debate. For one critic, quote, Gilman's eponymous hero, that is the wallpaper, becomes a character stripped of agency, end quote, and ultimately becomes a metaphor for an unwell woman's passivity. There are, however, some problems uh, with this analysis. Firstly, it assumes that the narrator is unwell, that because she sees things that others do not, there's some, there must be something wrong with her, that she must be suffering from some kind of psychosis. Another assumption is that the, the narrator is passive, but is she? Narrating a story is, is hardly a passive act. I mean, ask anyone who tells stories. And we've all heard about the dreaded blank page. The most egregious error in the analysis, however, is that the paper has no agency. That's not how Gilman has written the story. She has the paper, and th these are, this is her words, um, smoldering. She has the paper smoldering in its appearance. Its colors are sprawling and flamboyant, and its patterns are clearly active as they plunge off at outrageous uh, angles. But what's Gilman doing here? And how does it relate to the um, topic of our discussion today? I mean, the story predates new materialist thinking, and I doubt that Gilman uh, could have or would have articulated much in terms of theories about vegetal agency. But it is very, very clear that she offers us paper that is stripped of its former agency as a living arboreal body, and that this paper is, as I will continue to show, definitely agential. The history of paper haunts the narrative. There's something, and it's agential, that is in the wallpaper, and it needs decoding. If for uh, the critic that I mentioned, whose name is Dosani, it is the psychology of oppressed women that defines the wallpaper, then for Niles Tomlinson, it's something entirely different. For Tomlinson, uh, quote, Gilman's narrator continually couches the haunting yellow wallpaper in tropes of animality and contagion, end quote. And among other things, it is primarily Gilman's use of the verb creep uh, in which this is most evident. Yet this too seems to strain the text beyond what it actually offers. There are no animals in the text that Tomlin uh, imagines in the wallpaper uh, that Gilman describes. And everything about the wallpaper speaks of what John Keatley calls plant horror. And Keatley explains that, quote, at its most basic, plant horror marks the dread, the human marks human's dread of the wildness of vegetal nature, its untamability, its pointless excess, its uncontrollable growth. Matthew Wynne Civils proposes a similar idea, which he calls vegetal, quote, vegetal haunting, a condition in which plants, through their uncanny, alien, and seemingly transparent presence, serve as a disturbing, as disturbing spatio-temporal markers of human and environmental trauma. He argues that in 19th century American Gothic fiction, plants, quote, function as the haunted and the haunting, doubling for or even incorporating victims of trauma. And it is in the writings of American women at this time that we find a pronounced attention to the ways that the world of plants intersects with and, inform and informs a range of uh, social ills that darken the human realm. And of course, how we see plant intersections with human worlds determines the um, terror. The ability to see is always uh, a partial ability. There's much that we simply cannot see, no matter how hard we look. There are limits to what the human eye can perceive. Infrared and radio waves are beyond our perceptual limit, as is the ultraviolet spectrum for most people. Uh, for, for those of us who have seen the three-dimensional images of stereograms, it's baffling and frustrating to be faced with people 
who are unable to see such images. How do these people see those of us who can see such images? I mean, when you can see something that someone else cannot, what are you? Nuts? Hysterical? No. In, in need of psychiatric help, probably? Uh, you know. Moreover, because seeing is such an intensely personal experience that takes meaning in shared understandings and involvements, to talk meaningfully about a story such as the yellow wallpaper, it seems to me at any rate uh, necessary to similarly involve personal experiences and into public discussions. And uh, perhaps I might relate uh, an experience I had recently on the Seoul subway uh, system. It was crowded, it was rush hour. There was a woman stroking her dog, but I couldn't see the dog. She's just stroking her dog and gesturing to people that um, the dog was friendly and wouldn't bite. No doubt the subway woman was suffering from some kind of psychosis, uh, I mean, a loss of contact with external realities. I know because I kicked her imaginary dog and uh, it didn't register in her hand. There was no response. There was no dog there. Yet seeing something that others cannot see is not ipso facto a sign of psychosis. Otherwise, uh, stereograms would be a di diagnostic tool. And some of you can see the shark in the above uh, stereogram, some of you can't. Those of you who can doesn't mean you're crazy. We live in a world in which we only see a small part. Our vision is always partial and it's disturbing to ponder the question about what we're missing and about how accurate our assessment is of what we're missing. Gilman's story clearly and decisively shows a threatening plant agency, the creeping menace that Keatley mentions as characterizing plant horror. In addition to the many unbecoming plant images in the story, the plants have agency, which like the Venus flytrap is troubling. They are riotous, like those sprawling flamboyant patterns on the wallpaper. In between her telling us, telling us of the toadstools and their convolutions and her description of the shrieking fungi, the narrator yanks us back to the paper, the peculiarity of this paper, its mercurial nature, its malice, its effect on people. She explains that by moonlight, the moon shines in all night when there is a moon, I wouldn't know what, that it was the same paper. Matter may not be able to talk, but it is historied matter, if I may offer a slight modification of Serpil Obermann's and Serenella Iovino's storied matter. It's matter that's both storied and historied haunted by its history and inscribed with the narratives of its past. When I read this story, um, I don't know how you can see it. There's a large stump at the bottom and that's my son dwarfed by the tree stump. Um, when I read this story, um, when I read the story, I can't help but think of the forests around Vancouver where I grew up, the stumps in particular, many four meters across, they stud every bit of forested land in the Vancouver Lower Mainland and down south into Seattle and, and uh, uh, Washington and Oregon. They remain hidden behind the pattern of trees that replace the original forests. The trees uh, in all of these forests are second growth and are skinny compared with the stump. The stumps when I was a kid had and continue to have scars today from the springboard notches the men cut into the trees so that they could stand against the trunk and use the tree's leverage while cutting with their long saws. I've always wondered, what must these men must have been thinking? What must they have been thinking? What must have been going through their minds as they cut through these magnificent thousand year old trees and produced a denuded landscape that my young mind looked very much like the one in Dr. Seuss's The Lorax, uh, which came out when I was six. Seeing the forests of the Pacific Northwest that are no longer there is like looking into a stereogram. This is meaningless, uh, of course, unless you've actually seen a stereogram. You see another dimension, something behind the pattern. And by the way, the term behind the pattern uh, it occurs in the short story that I'm talking about several times. There's something behind the pattern that's not immediately visible. Clearly, however, uh, the evolutionary return of the past of which Keatley and Civil speak is a different kind of history matter. The genetic material of the trees having obviously been destroyed in the production of the paper in Gilman's story. Even so, evolutionary returns because the narrator of the yellow wallpaper so deeply imagines 
life growing out of the dead paper deserves sustained comment here. The life that the narrator of the yellow wallpaper sees is not genetic any more than the history of the paper itself is genetically encoded. Even so, life it had before it became paper. The history it lived, the stories it holds require decoding. Sequestered in the yellow wallpaper is a host of cultural and biological cues that the reader is compelled to decode. And the narrator offers images of some of the forces that are beyond human understanding or control forces that, as Keatley and Sibbles explain, are integral to the eco-Gothic tradition, forces that are multidimensional and complex. Two-dimensional readings won't work any more than two-dimensional seeing of a stereogram won't work. Yet, two-dimensional readings of the isomorphic similarities between the images uh, in the story can be seductive perhaps even in some sense rewarding, yielding insights on image patterns and so on, but nothing in the way of understanding uh, of the return of the past life that has been thwarted, the genetic passengers that have been killed, the histories and the futures ultimately destroyed and turned into paper. Moreover, if there's something in the paper that the reader simply does not see, something in the thwarting of vegetal agency that the narrator is on some level alert to, but that the reader is not, then perhaps it's reasonable to look uh, at what sort of techniques the author uses uh, to involve the reader in the story to experience and perceive as if being within the narrative itself. I'm sorry, we lost about five minutes when we were trying to do the, the stuff. I'm, I, and I don't wanna speed up because, uh, uh, so just bear with me uh, while I go through this. I'm, I'm aware that time is ticking. I also don't wanna read too quickly because then, ah, what is, Thank you. Only two more hours. No, no, no. <laughs> Feeling the vegetal haunting and plant horror in this story obviously is much harder than seeing and describing their presence. Ernest Hemingway was a master of techniques that produce the feelingness in literature uh, that engage our visceral responses. And there's a scene in Hemingway's After the Storm that I'd like to uh, bring in here just to show how incredible experiencing, I mean, experiencing fiction as a reader can be. There's a scene in which the treasure hunter is scavenging an ocean liner that has just sunken in the storm, in a storm. In my classes, I ask for a volunteer, any volunteers for extra credit to stand up and read the passage in one breath because it's one sentence. Uh, it's dangerous. I'm not gonna try it because um, I could, okay, I'll try it, here goes. Okay. I'm not standing, so if I pass out, kick me once and, and... I went down once more and cracked the glass, only cracked it, and when I came up, my nose was bleeding, and I stood on the bow of the liner with my bare feet on the letters of her name and my head just out and rested there, and then I swam over the skiff and pulled up onto it and sat there waiting for my head to stop aching and looking down into the glass water, but I bled, so I had to wash out the water glass. <sighs> Feel a little bit dizzy. It's clearly not a good sentence. Right? Certainly not an example of how we want our students to write, but in the context of what it does in the story, it's nothing short of brilliant. It makes the reader feel the very breathlessness that Hemingway is trying to convey. And if you try and read that sentence, you're gonna feel it. Hemingway puts you in the story. It's cool. It's just radically cool. What's surprising about critical essays on the yellow wallpaper is the absence of discussion about how the story attempts to make the reader truly experience and participate in the narrative, something that Hemingway does, something that Gilman also does here in a much different way. Such discussions would quickly reveal that this is radical fiction. Writing the narrator off as crazy, a diagnosis too many women in history have suffered is too easy. Lee Schweninger claims of Gilman's narrator that it is clear that her education has failed her in that it has not given her the opportunity to learn to analyze or read texts as demanding as the one inscribed in the wallpaper. Evidently, it has failed him too. 
There is more to the story than two-dimensional readings of isomorphic similarities between women and nature in this story. I don't want to disparage thematic readings that seek structural similarities since structural si similarities are hugely unimportant or indeed the basis of a lot of early ecofeminist work, uh, including uh, uh, Annette Collodny's The Lay of the Land. And to be sure, there are, uh, of course, structural similarities between the repressed and broken nature uh, in the story and the repressed and broken woman who narrates it. But these can result in simplistic and two-dimensional readings and banalities. It's not that these banalities are wrong in any way, they're simply two-dimensional. It's like looking at a stereogram and not seeing the image underneath, or at a forest in British Columbia and not seeing the ravaged first growth that's there behind the pattern of the new. There is a kind of two-dimensionality that really misses the depth of what is affectively happening in this story. It's like looking at the wallpaper and not seeing the quote, patterns committing every artistic sin that Gilman describes, not seeing how the pattern moves, not seeing how the pattern behaves. Seeing uh, the paper in all of its dimensions means seeing the history it has had. The afterlives of the forest here are the wallpaper and the diary, the afterlives of wood, and are, are the other dimensional image behind the pattern of the stereogram, so to speak. These are what we're looking at in the yellow wallpaper. The reader is made to experience these seemingly hallucinatory visions, the seemingly hallucinatory vision of the stereogram that the wallpaper offers. And rather than walking away from this and discussing only what we know we can see directly, I'm suggesting that we take the time, as this story implores us to do, to see beyond, behind the pattern because doing so allows us to fully appreciate the breadth of Gilman's ethical concerns. Gilman is careful, perhaps too careful, since there's been no commentary on this matter, to weave the vestiges of arboreal ancestry into this story and thereby to link the violent pruning and cutting down of vegetal agency with the thwarting of women's agency. Part of what Gilman is showing is that patriarchal violence against nature, like that against women, is often simply not immediately or clearly visible. And this is part of what allows it to continue. And that to call people crazy who see things that others do not participates in this violence rather than critiques it. Many a critic, it seems, is guilty of this. The wallpaper had a life before it was pulped and reduced, and this life haunts the story if only we could see it. Decoding the paper of the story is a material act in our world that can help to change patriarchal structures. Deflecting the focus off the paper in the story, moreover, flies in the face of the fact the narrative offers. It's surprising how, despite the centrality of paper in this story, there's no academic discussion of it. The word paper appears 22 times in the story, and the word wallpaper appears 12 times, with a total of 34 references to paper of some kind or another, mostly wallpaper, but also diary paper. Paper is the ambivalent space of the forest brought inside. Silence of the trees and the forests and the yellow wallpaper should not blind us to their histories and their rights. Men have cut and killed and desecrated and exploited those trees, those genomic carrying cases. It's reasonable to see these bodies haunting the house and the hapless narrator, not quite in the way as the Venus flytrap threatens, but acting nevertheless. Seeing this allows us to understand that imprisoned with the narrator is an entire history of arboreal rape and abuse. In this sense, the narrator seems to become indistinguishable from the paper, not because she's mad, but because she sees differently, sees what others do not. And while she certainly does not see the arboreal history of the paper, nothing in the text would suggest this, we should. This is obviously in line with what readers do. We often see through the characters and their behaviors what they themselves cannot see. What the narrator does see, I mean, in addition uh, to what is in the paper, however, is very telling. She says toward the end of the story that, quote, outside you have to creep on the ground and everything is green instead of yellow. One has to wonder what the relationship is between the greenness of everything and the need to creep. If there wasn't so much creeping inside, it would be tempting to suggest that the narrator wants to be careful not to kill the green plants and therefore you have to creep on the ground. There's nothing, however, to support this yet. The question about yellowness must arise here. Why yellow? Why yellow wallpaper? 
And why mention the yellow and green here, except to remind the reader that plants turn to yellow when they die. I've got about two more minutes. Anyone who has ever left anything on their grass lawn has surely found that stunted by the effects of human actions and deformed by the effects of its own thwarted agency, the grass will become deformed, will turn yellow after a few days and will eventually die. Yellow is the image of thwarted vegetal agency in this story. So powerful is this thwarted agency that enlivens, it enlivens color itself, thrusting color beyond its proper evocative elm, realm. Color is after all seen, not smelled. It's a queer description to be sure, one that twists the mind like Milton's oxymorons, forcing the reader to contemplate the madness of a color transgressing its visual doma domain, not only in becoming a yellow smell, but being a pattern that laughs and mocks. By the end of the story, John wants to chop down what is barring him uh, from his wife, and he's crying for an axe. The axe, of course, is an image evocative of violence, and its primary use is, of course, to cut down trees. Yet there's a profound victory uh, for the narrator at the end, if only we could see it. If only we could see beyond the prejudices that make us think that she's crazy. The fact that the narrator comes out of the wallpaper to use her own words, that she is not walled in. Uh, the fact is that she comes out of the wallpaper, she's not walled in, and this gains in significance when we consider that the walls are plastered with the remains of a life violently ended. If Robert Oak Harrison is correct in claiming that quote, walls no less than writing define civilization and that they are the monuments of resistance against time like writing itself, then the silent resistance, if not of the walls, then on them, is a resistance in part made visible by the shared subjugation to patriarchal power and violence between the paper and the narrator. Equally visible is that civilization defined within the story is one that has blood on its hands, or pulp is perhaps a better word. The eco-Gothic taps into the oppression of women. It does so in this story through a return of the past that's not entirely visible. It's the history of vegetal agency and life and ethical rights that have been thwarted and that literary readings can help to keep silent. Readings that require an insane woman, matter stripped of narratives and men resolutely in control. Reading for aborted agencies and looking for the obscured histories in the yellow wallpaper resists these. Last paragraph. For the perfect Northwest forests, the life of the first growth forest is the history matter behind the pattern of the second growth. For the narrator of the yellow wallpaper, the history and previous life of the pages of the diary book is immediately established through her description of them as dead paper, as horrid paper. Um, it is in the eponymous uh, wallpaper of the story, however, that the full implications of aborted arboreal agency take full horrific form. Inseparable from the repressed and broken nature in this story, is the repressed and broken woman who narrates it. The inverted mirror image of her lack of control over herself is the riotous flowers, the gnarly trees, the toadstools budding and sprouting in endless convolutions that horrify as readily as the Venus flytrap or as triffids. She looks and sees these things, sees, quote, not the beautiful, but the old and foul, bad, yellow things. And through her, the reader sees not the horrors of nature, but of thwarted natural agency, abrogations of vegetal rights. The story evokes a response not of ecophobia proper, but rather of a fear of nature's response to the human hand. Human challenges the reader to look hard at the continuing effects of patriarchal violence, to stretch the senses beyond their limits, and to see and feel, metaphorically and literally, the horrors. Moreover, if we assume that the narrator is psychotic because she sees things that others do not, we do a disservice to all women, to forests and to the story, and to the very paper on which the story is written. It is, after all, a story about paper, a vegetal narrative that demands attention to the ethical treatment of plant. Thank you very much for your impatience. Thank you very much, Jeff. Um, I will avoid this open for questions, but for only 
first question, perhaps the rest of the questions from this week here in the category during the book signing event of Simon Oscar. Uh, so please, let's have uh, the two questions if possible. Well, maybe the Zoom chat box is not going to work. Yes. You look like you have a question. <laughs> <laughs> There are two possibilities. It was incomprehensible. <laughs> yes. All right. Looks like no questions. There's, there's questions. No, no, not 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 through Zoom. Um, I have a question. Uh, thank you for your wonderful presentation. Um, I'm interested in the question of the Something I read in the dark season on the edge, where it talks about the necessity of a multi-scholar reading, and especially it talks about the third scale reading of texts uh, in which you look at the environmental history uh, behind the pattern of uh, So my question is, do you think that the, the task of the literary scholar today is that of reading on uh, texts on this third scale or pretty, and does this make a 2D uh, it's a good question. Thank you. Um, I, I'm not. I'm not sure that that I would. I would say that. Uh, I. I think it really depends on the text. On a text like this, where it's so obvious that there's something going on, where the where the author. I mean, forget the narrator. Where the author is trying to show us something uh, that is difficult to see, and then. Uh, um, yeah, and then having the narrator written off, you know, in this in this very conventional patriarchal medicine kind of way, and to have critics not see that um, is very disturbing. So for for uh, a piece of literature like this, I it's uh, yes, I, I think three D reading or reading, you know, outside of the two D uh, is very necessary. I'm not sure it works for all. Um, I mean, it in in the way that uh, uh, Tim Timothy Clark describes yes. Uh, I mean, we can certainly do um, you know that sort of deep uh, Marxist kind of reading of really any text, but um, I'm, I'm not quite sure how it would work uh, in the way that I'm describing it here. Looking, uh, I'm not quite sure. Yeah, I guess is the best answer. Yeah. I don't want to blather too much, but does that is that a satisfying answer? Thank you. Any other questions? Gizan wants to. Oh, there, there we go. This is not a question, but a comment and a huge thank you for yeah. highlighting this. Because <laughs> um, I think two weeks ago, in my Gothic class, we were talking about this exact same story. And my students delivered the presentation on it, and they were quite good at it because they kind of uncovered, I mean, they didn't immediately mark the lady in question here as crazy because they were aware of the patriarchal violence going on there, uh, which was good on their part because they're just undergraduate students. But at the same time, I mean, I was kind of mind blown with what you have brought here, because I mean, there is this obvious reference to the vegetable bus, because I remember in the story, uh, there's this, in the garden that we mentioned, there are a lot of beautiful flowers and trees. There are long descriptions of this, and unlike, most of the Gothic stories, we don't have a dark setting here, and it's very nice, sunny weather, it's springtime, etc., etc. So, um, th there is clear reference to ways to life for sure, but I wasn't expecting this to come out of paper. <laughs> so, uh, that was mind blowing. So, if you ever decide to publish this as a paper, I would like to insert this into my syllabus. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, actually, for those two. Brief questions. Actually, I will use the privilege of being the uh, sort of presenter. And just one little comment. I was wondering about during our trip, we were talking about these stereograms, and you were planning to test me with one of them if I managed to pass <laughs> it or not. Actually, the stereogram that you said, can you see the plane in the first? Uh, instance well i couldn't but i saw something else two things mm -hmm. actually one was uh, 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 as far as i remember 
there was this turkey image. Oh. <laughs> well, actually, few turkeys, and plus a crocodile. So would that also do uh, something that you cannot see, but I can? But I honestly did see those things. Uh, so perhaps we can I think argue about this during the coffee break. This may be a sign of psychosis. <laughs> <laughs> Well, not surprised. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for this beautiful speech. And actually, as the Padukya University, we would like to present you with this uh, uh, 10 saplings actually planted oh. on your behalf. Uh, so it's a uh, Sivas Karshiaka Memorial Forest. And it's a uh, sort of thank you. Uh, to support our efforts to create a better world. Thank you, Thank you very much, Simon. Thank you very much. I'm indeed. happy to present you this certificate. Oh, this is perfect. Wow. Oh, thank you. Let me just close.